I uh, was born uh, near Franklin, uh, near Pacific School on uh, Franklin Boulevard and uh, on a uh, small strawberry f uh, field uh, where my parents first leased their land. And then we, my father had enough money to buy over there near Matha Field and he bought 20 acres of uh, very marginal land, but uh, for growing strawberries, you know, you didn't have to have uh, uh, good so-called so prime soil. And uh, so he worked that land, which, which took a lot of hard work. And uh, I started first grade in uh, Edward Kelly School, a one-room school uh, with um, sometimes 60 children with one teacher. And she was just absolutely amazing, amazing. Uh, she taught everything. And we thought singing uh, Home to Our Mountains, which is from Il Trovatore, was, you know, just an ordinary second grade song or whatever, you know. And uh, she was our umpire, she was our everything. Uh, anyway, I grew up there, and these were during the Depression years. I was born in 1923. And uh, through, all throughout the Depression, my brothers and sisters were born. I have six brothers and two sisters. And we survived well on this um, 20 acres. My mother said, you know, everybody was complaining about not getting enough food to eat, and we had food rotting in our gardens. When Executive Order 9066 came about, things went topsy-turvy, totally, totally. You know. Here we were, happy, going to school, growing up, being loved, feeling secure, and all of a sudden, you know, I couldn't drive my car more than f over five miles. And we had to go and, and pick up old suitcases for what we called the trip, the big trip for our kids. My mother said, no, the children have to grow up happy and secure. We're not going to talk about all this while they're awake. So after we put them all to bed, then my mother, father, and I would discuss plans. Uh, and so they thought it was a kind of a fun thing to, to go on a trip. And um, I would order, I ordered, um, new clothes for them with the checks that came in from picking strawberry, uh, for a strawberry crop, which was at its peak. All around here, you know, the floor in the Elk Grove, the strawberries were just coming to a peak. And this, this whole uh, year's work, hard work, would show in, in, in the crops. And then that would carry us through until next next year. But in this case, we just had to let everything go. And I, I was totally amazed watching my parents who went about what they had to do and uh, kept on picking the strawberries, kept on sending them out. All during that time, my father was planning in his mind what we would be, he would be taking. We were allowed, as you know, you know, only what we could carry and, uh, and one bedroom. And so I, I, I uh, watched him on the day of leaving on the day of evacuation, which was in May uh, 1942. When I got out of bed, my father took my blankets, put it out on the living room floor, 
And um, as he rolled it up, he hid inside things that he thought would be important. And we ask, often ask the students when we speak, what would you take if you were in this situation? And not one student out of thousands that we've sp spoken to in 20 years, you know, would be able to guess what my father packed, I mean, hid inside the bedroom. That was forbidden, but he knew that he had to do this for the sake of the family. So he put in a uh, hammer, uh, nails, bags of nails, a uh, roll of wire, saw, the small saw that uh, folds up, not the big one that he often used, um, and a bucket of all things, you know. Why would you take a bucket? That was so necessary. And then a gallon jug, and that was important. Uh, and it was, um, and also, well, he, he also wrapped up my old violin, which I didn't want to take. But he wrapped it up and put it inside one of our blankets. Um, and then bags of seeds, you know. How can you think about seeds in times like this? Flower seeds and vegetable seeds. You know, he hid them in the creases of our blankets. And the one thing, one bedroll was not a bedroll. It was a huge canvas, just in case we needed to put up shelter somewhere. Can you imagine having, having uh, eight children at that time? My brother was already, he had volunteered after Pearl Harbor, uh, and he was in um, Fort Leonard Wood in Missouri. So there were the rest of us. And, and all their focus, their focus was always kodomo no tameni. I don't know if you've heard that before. We, we've, I've heard it many, many times, for the sake of the children. All the Issei's would say that, for the sake of the children, we do this. For the sake of the children, we will put up with all this. You know? Pinedale Assemblies, I remember going through that gate and there were guard towers up above, and I was holding on to my little brother's hand. He was three years old, um, and watching for my other siblings up ahead in this crowd of people that just went through this gate. And up above there were these guard towers all surrounding the compound. Uh, this camp was for uh, 5,000 inmates, and there were 4,000 something in there. Um, and we had to scramble to find an empty barracks and got there. Um, one of the most difficult times there was the, uh, what, what we call the Obenjo, the latrine. And um, it was uh, all open, one big room on a dirt floor with, with two rows of holes uh, on, a, on a wooden, uh, what do you call it, not a platform, but anyway. And it, at, at 19, I had just turned 19, you know, and it was so difficult for me to sit side by side and back to back with all these other people I didn't know. You know? And I used to, I used to watch and s from behind the barracks and count how many went in and how many came out. And as soon as I knew there was nobody in there, I made a dash for it. Um, and then I thought, well, I'll, I'll do my duty in the middle of the night. <laughs> so <laughs> I, did, I did that and everybody else had the same idea, it seems. But it was, it was terrible. And then I think, you know, they were all big holes like that. 
and none for children. And I thought, you know, here they were bringing in children. Why didn't they make child size little holes for them? You know? But that was how it went. See, there were 16 assembly centers hastily built, and then some of them were assigned to the Santa Anita racetracks and into horse stalls. I mean, that would, that would be terrible. They, they had whitewashed the inside of the stall, and they said the smell would never go away. Uh, then, uh, so there were 16 of those, and then we were waiting there until uh, the permanent camps were ready. Uh, and we were there about two and a half months. And what was interesting to me was people started bringing out seeds and planting them you know, between barracks or on the side of the barracks. I remember the f there was nothing green in the whole place, just black barracks and brown dirt and, and dust. And, um, uh, I remember walking along with a whole bunch of children uh, and saw a group just stooped over uh, something and looking very agitated. So what was happening, I thought, well, somebody died, and I wonder what we'd do if that happened. But it, I went closer, and here was this one little green thing coming out of the ground one leaf, you know, and everybody was gathered there watching, uh, uh, talking about that leaf. It, and it was a uh, morning glory seed. And we made a pilgrimage to that. Everybody went. In, in the meantime, other people planted things. And that, that morning glory went right up the wall uh, of the tar papered barracks and bloomed, it was, it was beautiful, you know, beautiful. But then later, zinnias, all kinds of things, radishes, all kinds of things grew between the barracks. You know. We were transferred to, I didn't know where at that time. And I used to worry about having packed the right things for my brothers and sisters. We didn't know whether we were gonna go to cold country and we would need a coat or we go to hot country. As it turned out, we went south. And I remember that train trip so well. Uh, all the time, we had to pull down the shades and keep it down. And these were old, old trains that came out of mothballs or whatever. And uh, dirty, 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 you couldn't see the uh, th through the glass hardly, and uh, and uh, had to wipe off the dust off the seat and all. But um, w w all through the night, we had to keep the shades, blinds drawn. And um, the, there were guards on both sides of the coach, always. But after a while, they got a little lax and they s sat down on the floor and just leaned their rifle against the wall, you know. And some of the guys started walking down the aisle and I said, if those guys uh, don't come back, I think I'll go too. So, <laughs> because I thought that the guards in the next car would send them back. But they didn't come back. So I got brave and I walked down this, it's nighttime, dark, and all the little kids are sleeping and the legs are uh, sticking out in the aisle and you had to be careful. And so many cars down, I reached the baggage car. And the, um, there were all the guys, piles of bedrolls, you know and nobody knew where we were. Uh, I was so tired, I leaned against one bedroll and just fell asleep. And woke up just 
just hardly able to breathe. And, and um, it was uh, morning and uh, someone was shining through the slats of this old, old um, car. Um, and and um, I thought that, that that train would never stop. It went click, tick, click, click, tick, click, click, click. Finally it stopped and the door swung open. And here were these uh, uh, so soldiers with their guns. They, they were so surprised to see us all right at the door standing, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> here we were. And, um, and, and there were rows and rows and rows of, um, of uh, army trucks. It was all sand, it seemed, and the hot sky and the brown desert. That's, that's all it was. It was in the desert. And I thought, oh, I've got to get back to my family. I've got to find them because I left that car, you know. And I started dashing towards the back end, and right away the guard came up and said, you stay there, and put me, and directed me towards one of the army trucks. And in the middle of the desert, there was this huge sign that said, post an Indian reservation. I said, Oh, how nice, I said, you know, the Indians have invited us to their reservation. And in high school, I had studied that the Indians were given uh, fishing grounds and camping grounds and, you know, would be nice there. Well, we rode on and on and on. I find out, found, f finally realized that this was the reservation. This was it, you know, another, another shocker in, in the facts of history for me. There were cabin in a windmill here and there in that desert. That was it. But anyway, right as I saw these hundreds and hundreds of black tar papered barracks, I just could not hold up. My legs got weak, and I said, oh, you better hold on because you're going to lose your family. You better hold on. But I just couldn't help it. I just fell, right? Just sort of went down like a, an unhitched drape. Just went boom, and that was the last conscious thought I, I, I had. So. Three hours later, I woke up, and here I am lying on my back, and here's this big slab of cement on top. And I thought to myself, I guess I died. That's the first thought I had, you know. And I looked over that way, and here were more. <coughs> there, were, there were big tubs, cement tubs all down the whole barracks and all these people were lying down I didn't I thought they were dead and I looked for somebody to move you know and uh, and finally I made the move to see if any of them would be my family and this guy saw me way back there and he came trotting down with his clipboard what's your name Kiyosato, what's your number? And I panicked because I couldn't remember my family number. He says, that's all right, follow me. So I got out of there. Then my sister was way over there on the other side. She was about, what, 10 years old? She hopped right up, seeing me, she was so happy. You know, she just hopped off her, you know, off her cot and followed us out. But um, we were, we were uh, directed to get into a jeep, and this guy seemed to know where my family was. So we rode all around the camp. I kept looking as the jeep went on. There's desert on one side and all the barracks on this side. But I couldn't see any familiar faces, and it was hot, hot, hot. Um, then. 
as we went to the edge of the Camp 220, um, um, Block 229, which was the last block in Poston Camp 2. There were three camps, Post, uh, Poston Camp 1, 2, and 3, and somebody named them Postum, Toastum, and Roastum. <laughs> but anyway, that's what my father told us later. And, uh, and here was my mother carrying a long sack. Uh, dragging a long sack and she had just filled it with straw uh, at the pile that they had left at each block straw and they issued body bags well mattress bags we found out later they were body bags uh, and uh, so my mother so I hopped out and uh, helped her carry it into the barracks but I was so tired I just lay on that and and uh, um, didn't know what to do. I, I was miserable, you know. You try to breathe and that hot air just goes and burns your trachea. So you breathe real slowly to cool some of that off. And um, I don't know, my mother, my mother was pretty remarkable. Um, she had filled everybody's bags, I mean straw uh, body bags, and put it on each one of the cots. Now, if you were a family of six or less, you had one room. And because we were more, we had two rooms, four of us and six, uh, six over there. Uh, and uh, so anyway, she um, uh, got us all ready. But you know, try and sleep on a straw mattress in 125, 30 degrees. It's miserable, miserable. So I just rolled it off and, and threw the straw out into the desert, and folded up the sack. Then we would, what we did was to go to the corner faucet at night, all through the night. Uh, everybody would line up and slush water on the cot and then go back and get two or three hours of rest and then wake up bone dry again. Uh, you know, I thought so often of, I don't know if you read anything by Henry McLemore. He was a syndicated columnist and he was terrible, terrible. And I thought about him. He said, put them all out in the desert and let them become like the skulls of cattle. I thought about that and I said, we're almost there. Here we are, you know, out in the desert. And the camp life was not very uh, conducive to family life. The families got fractured. You know, you 250 people eating in a mess hall uh, and Teenagers would eat over there, and parents would have trouble keeping the family together. So my father and mother decided anything is better than this for the family. So he contracted uh, uh, to work on a sugar beet farm in Colorado. And so we were given, or they were given, I was already out. I had gotten a permit to get out to school in Michigan. So, so they uh, uh, contracted for this and were given $25 per person. That's what anybody got when you left camp, $25. And um, uh, left for uh, this sugar beet farm. When I came back to visit them, uh, there, 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 there was this one shack. Well, it's, it's kind of like a cab, worker's cabin, and one windmill, uh, no electricity, but the family was all together, all together. And, uh, we worked hard. We all worked hard. It was, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with thinning sugar beets 
and topping sugar beets, you know, that, that's uh, very uh, strenuous physical labor. But my father was a great storyteller, and we'd always want to be working right beside him. He and, and he'd tell these stories, and we'd help each other so that we'd all be near him and go down the road. And, and um, uh, work was not all that, that tedious. You know. With all the tools that my father had, that he hid, you know, he um, made shelves for our barracks room, he made tables, he made all sorts of things with his nail, uh, hammer nails. And people would come and be so envious, and he'd just share all this. And then after a while, he cut the wire into nails because uh, he ran out of nails. Um, but th all this tool also in uh, Colorado, he cut down the dead, uh, semi-dead locust trees and made bunk beds for the kids in this little, little place. It, we looked like we were living in a Pullman train. Uh, and, and that's what I slept on, too. Uh, the first thing was to get a permit. I had to go to Greeley, uh, Colorado, get a permit to go to the West Coast. And they were going to send me to scout out whatever, you know, was going on. And so that was kind of a scary bittersweet journey for me. You know, get on that train. My mother had fixed me a, a, a rice balls and chicken and all, I mean, enough to eat for the trip, and uh, headed west. And you, we had heard all these terrible things that were happening. A lot of the evacuees had gone home, but they came back again because they, they, there was too much violence and some houses were burnt down. And uh, there was even uh, dynamites set in one of the houses um, in Loomis. Things like that were happening. So it was scary. When I came back, real quickly now, the whole farm was stripped, totally. We had 10 acres to set our foot on. The other 10 acres had to be sold under duress. My father had gotten a letter saying, if you don't sell that 10 acres by the railroad tracks, we're going to seize it for, or for um, wartime use. And so he had no choice. So I think he got something like $175 an acre. Uh, so, my 32 Studebaker was gone, the tractor was gone, uh, the farm truck was gone, all the farm equipment was gone, everything removable was gone, even the butane tanks for the gas stove was gone. You know? uh, so, we, we started off with um, practically from the ground zero. And this is the way so many people did. Quietly, we just went to work in the neighboring farms, picking, picking hops, picking uh, prunes, uh, picking fruit, uh, and uh, working in the vineyards. And, and slowly, we were able to, to uh, get ourselves going. The fact that, see, I can go into any restaurant now and eat without worrying about it. When I came back, I didn't know which restaurant to go to. In downtown Sacramento, I was hungry. I went up and down K Street, and I knew that the further up I went, my chances would be slim. I went to the lower end of town, and and you're too young probably to remember Hart's Cafeteria, where all k kinds of people went in, you know. All colors of people went in. So I had my little old suitcase at that time and uh, w walked in and uh, 
had uh, my uh, meatloaf and overcooked peas and whatever <laughs> it was. And I was so relieved to be able to eat. Now I don't worry about that, you know. Things have changed, thank goodness.